Coming up on the Civil Discourse, a panel discussion titled, When Great Artists Behave Badly, featuring Tony Award-winning dancer-choreographer Bill T. Jones and a panel of esteemed experts. This discussion will highlight examples of controversial artists and explore how we separate the art from the artist in cases of toxic, immoral, personal behavior. We want artists there because they're doing something, an existential gesture of pushing back against the absurdity of life, and they make, they leave artifacts. And those artifacts are oftentimes uh, a lot to take in their time, and some of them fall with time and some of them grow with time. Hello and welcome to the Civil Discourse. I'm your host, Paula Barantz Cohn, Dean of the Pannoni Honors College and Professor of English at Drexel University, speaking to you from my home in Center City, Philadelphia during the COVID-19 pandemic. For this episode, the first of two installments made possible by the generous support of Abby and Patrick Dean, we're pleased to partner with the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia for a panel on the topic when great artists behave badly. We hope in the future to be able to have events with the Barnes at their world-renowned museum on the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. The personal life of artists, and here I speak of artists in any medium, was long considered off limits in the appraisal of their art. In recent years, however, we've become more attuned to the way in which art has come into being both the historical conditions in which it was made and the biographical facts of the artist are now subject to scrutiny and interrogation. Our guest panelists for this episode delve into the question of how much of an artist's life should fi figure in how we approach the art they create. And as a corollary, how free can artists be from the social and historical context in which they create? And now for part one of our panel discussion on when great artists behave badly. We have a group of panelists here with us today who are well suited to address this topic. And I'll briefly introduce them and then set our discussion going. First, Bill T. Jones. He's a MacArthur and Tony Award winning dancer, choreographer, and visual artist, and director of the experimental dance organization, New York Live Arts, and of the Bill T. Jones Arnie Zane Dance Company. He holds the special distinction and I like to add this, of having once been body painted by Keith Haring. Aruna D'Souza is an art critic, commentator, writer, and editor of books on the subject of art, race, and gender. Her most recent book, White Walling, Art, Race, and Protest in Three Acts, was named one of the best books of 2018 by the New York Times. Eric Hatala Mathis is an associate professor of philosophy and director of the Frost Center for the Environment at Wellesley College. His work is devoted to the ethics, politics, and aesthetics of cultural heritage, art, and the environment. He's completing a book entitled Drawing the Line, What to Do with the Work of Immoral Artists from Museums to the Movies. And finally, Martha Lucy, is Deputy Director for Research, Interpretation, and Education at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. She's a historian of 19th and 20th century European art and visual culture, and an expert on the Impressionists and on Pierre-Auguste Renoir in particular. So let's begin with the question of how we should respond to the malfeasance of great artists. For example, Edgar Degas' anti-Semitism, Picasso's vile treatment of women, Bertolt Brecht's enthusiasm for Stalin, Philip Johnson's racism. When such facts come to light about artists, do you think we're obligated to take them into account in our evaluation of their art? What I think what we can't do is um, antecedently, right from the beginning, just artificially try to cordon off the artist uh, from the artwork. 
Uh, we need to be open to the possibility that the lives of artists have relevance to our interpretation of their work. And I think there's ultimately nothing that puzzling about this, right? So while there's of course controversy about what kinds of contextual features are relevant to aesthetic interpretation of work, there are all kinds of features of the lives of artists that we often take into account when thinking about art interpretation, right? When they lived, the political climate they were working in, geographic context, et cetera. So I think it's arbitrary to just say, well, you know, the moral lives of artists, that couldn't possibly be relevant to our interpretation. I do think though that it's incumbent upon us to explain why in a particular case, the moral lives of artists are relevant to interpreting particular works of art. Let me push back a little on that and ask somebody else on the panel, if you think necessarily, and this moves a little bit against Eric's point, that there would be the imprint of say Degas anti-Semitism somewhere in the art itself. That by necessity, given that's in the fabric of the character of the artist, it shows itself in the art. I'll jump in here and just say that the, the artists that we see in museums aren't there because they were good people or bad people. They were there because museums say, um, tend to uh, confer ideas of genius on people who look and who look a certain way, who have a certain gender, who perform their gender in certain ways. And so already all sorts of things have gone into the determination of artistic greatness beyond the idea of aesthetics. Those judgments have already been made. And so I think that we've already taken it into account some very basic things about the artist's life uh, mm -hmm. when we've decided who we're looking at in the first place. So let me ask, and I guess I will go to Martha with this one, a museum making an evaluation of its collection then, in light of what you say, Aruna and Eric, do you think there should be this sort of evaluation as we do? I mean, we evaluate a legal provenance of works now, which wasn't done in the past, and that's been fairly recent. Should there be a board of evaluation as to the moral life of the artist according to certain standards and so forth as to whether that art is exhibited in a, in the, in a given museum? I would not want to go through, let me back up for a minute. I'm going to be talking about dead artists. I, do, I don't know how to answer this question when it comes to living artists, but when it comes to dead artists, I wouldn't wanna go through the Mets collection or through the Barnes's collection and start um, kind of taking things off of the wall based on whether that artist had done something immoral in the past. Um, I would not want to do it. And it's not just because there would be practically nothing left to look at, but it's also because um, I think then that we're losing an opportunity to talk about these things. But I think that the responsibility of museums now um, and the way that a lot of museum industry people are thinking is that it's really about education. So if it's Degas anti-Semitism, whether it's just something that you know about him as an artist or even if it's showing up in the work itself, which it, it does, I think that we need to talk about that and we need to know that that was, that, that was part of history. I'm not sure if I'm on the right panel. Uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, the, pa the, the paradigm of museums is a problematic one for me to get into, but I'll do my best. I think I'm going to try to, my remarks are about artists. And uh, I thought that the title of this was a bit misplaced because what my experience would be, we should have another panel that says when uh, institutions, critics, uh, collectors, uh, tastemakers behave badly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that's the next thing I will say is uh, some basic pronouncements about art. Art should be dangerous. Art should really, uh, it should not be easily digested. And I now this is a, a black man, a black gay man speaking. Uh, and I know that I can be offended, but I think that you really have to separate um, the work from uh, the person. Now, we want artists there because they're doing something, an existential gesture of pushing back against the absurdity of life. And they make, they leave artifacts. And those artifacts are oftentimes uh, a lot to take in their time. 
And some of them fall with time and some of them grow with time. So for us to put guardrails up, separate them out. Some things are against the law, period. If you're abusing a child, that's against the law. Let the law take care of that. And if you're abusing- But, but, uh, not, you, but not censor the art of that person. Yeah, of course not. So no. but do you think as an artist versus a critic, because I think when you said you're on the wrong panel, I'm wondering if there's been an age old tension between critic and artist, do you feel that still in our yes. culture? Yes, there's art, there's something that at the art that I'm talking of is at a level that I'd say it's something next to someone's spiritual understanding of being alive. No, I, I really think art should be dangerous. It should not decorate. And I'm talking as a living artist. So I want to Aruna. jump in because I think that um, Bill, who's I'm just a huge fan of your work and, and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, your career. But I want to talk, I want to change the terms a little bit because I, I do think that art should be dangerous. Um, you know, and I'm not sure that often we are talking about artists who are making dangerous art when we're talking about this question, right? So that, so that I'm not sure that in all cases um, that what we're ta often talking about when people get riled up about artists behaving badly are artists who have um, personally acted in ways that are offensive. In your case, it was you know, the work was dangerous and uncomfortable for people and 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 that was the problem. For certain people, for certain people. For certain people. Okay, for ex I'm going to give you an example that I think is really mm -hmm. clear mm -hmm. because and that speaks as well to Martha's um, comment about um, the necessary conversations. So I went to the National Portrait Gallery after the Kehanda Wiley portrait of Barack Obama was installed there. And as I was walking around that floor of the National Portrait Gallery, I look over and there's uh, Chuck Close's portrait of Bill Clinton, right? Chuck Close is an artist who was accused of, um, of uh, sexual harassment and abuse of a number of women. And the National Portrait Gallery decided in the context of the sort of um, first flush of the Me Too movement that um, his retrospective should be canceled. So there was a controversy, do we cancel retrospectives? Do we only give retrospectives to you know, decent people? All of that kind of stuff. I don't think anyone would argue, no one that I know would argue that Chuck Close is making the most cutting edge, dangerous, thought provoking work on the contemporary scene by a long shot. But what was most interesting to me is the wall label for this picture, because the wall label for this picture, which as Martha said, fine, keep it on the wall and have the difficult conversations. The wall label for this picture talked extensively about Bill Clinton's various sexual scandals and did not mention the artists own sexual scandals, right? So in, in that sense, my problem is not um, that uh, we need to take all the work down. My problem is the apparatus, which doesn't want to actually have the conversations that need to be uh, put forward. In, the case, in Bill's case, that as, as he points out, it's a very different situation of an artist who is being, you know, who is being put on the spot because of the power of a single art critic um, and uh, where that turns into a kind of sort of conservative physician being used as, as a standard, as, as an aesthetic standard, and that's problematic. If people don't know about the controversy, the victim art controversy, it was a work that I made in the 90s. Uh, I had made um, uh, a work called Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin, The Promised Land, which was a work taking on the issues of race before it became a pop issue, right? And then uh, that also blew up. A lot of people were upset about that. Uh, Last Supper at Uncle Tom's Cabin featuring 52 handsome nudes. And the piece ended with a stage of um, 
anywhere between 52 to 60 plus people of all shapes and sizes and ages naked, bathed in a golden light and singing like children. Okay, we got over that. And then I decided I want to make a work that was completely, you could not say it was divisive along any lines. In other words, we're all born, we grow, and some of us reproduce, and then we die. Mortality. I went around and I did survival workshops with, in about 35 communities uh, with people who were or had been dealing with life-threatening illness. But this particular critic um, said she had obviously heard or something. And she said, uh, this, uh, there's, it's impossible for her to review work that's for, about people she feels sorry for. And it was unfair of, I guess, me to make it and the Brooklyn Academy of Music aware which presents it because it's there to make you feel bad. And therefore, you should not go. Hmm. Don't go see this work. It's just there to make you feel bad. So how we got here, and uh, Aruna, I'm, I'm trying to make that important distinction you make between what is the object and who made it? What's the story behind it? I still don't know why, I, if the national still feels it's important to put a label on a work by Chuck Close or any representation of Bill Clinton. Does the work stand? Is that different from putting a label on a statue to give context to it? where the sin is a historical sin. And I was going to ask Eric, because he is an environmentalist as well as a critic of art, about the statue in front of the Museum of Natural History that is going to be taken down, although many people feel it should have a label explaining it, um, that shows Teddy Roosevelt on a horse a Native American and an African on either side. But uh, do you have thoughts about this? Now, I realize I'm moving away from artists behaving badly to history behaving badly and therefore impinging on the artist. How much does a work of art like this, which I think is a masterful work of sculpture, is it too offensive to stand or to stand there? And I'll start with Eric, and I also would like maybe uh, Martha to comment. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on in that question. I mean, I think when it comes to um, public artwork in particular and monuments that have a particular function, which is to, to honor, um, I think it's really important that we think carefully about the, the public meaning of those sculptures and the messages they might send. So, you know, quite apart from anything uh, involving Teddy Roosevelt, uh, I think a lot of people have convincingly uh, argued that this statue in particular embodies certain forms of colonialism and racism and then projects those as the public face of the Museum of Natural History. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of good reasons to remove this particular sculpture. So I think that, you know, context can matter. Uh, I think that the way in which we provide context about the lives of artists and the potential relevance too of the lives of artists to interpretation of their work within a museum context um, can be quite different from how we would do that. Well, I was wondering, uh, isn't there another way that they're taking some of these sculptures and putting them in their own preserved uh, location. Therefore, they we go there because we want to see things that are troublesome historically. Mm -hmm. Now, that's where I think it should be. But I do think that it has it's it says something about history, as Eric says, and therefore it's it's in, it stills a, a sense of conversation in us. I wouldn't destroy I, it. I agree with that too. Um, I do not think that we should should get rid of it because it is part of our history, and we need to we need to acknowledge that. Um, but context is everything in this case. Um, having it outside as a public monument, I mean, what are what are public monuments about? Usually it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's what celebration. We, what we value. I'd like to show the other visual we have, which is of a Renoir painting. Yep. Um, Martha's expertise is in Renoir and in, in uh, Impressionist painting. I think the Barnes has one of the largest collections of Renoirs in the world. And he has been, I mean, uh, 
uh, targeted as the embodiment of the male gaze. And in ma many critics have accused him of, of, of painting pornography. And I want to know what Martha has to say to that. Renoir is um, the poster boy for the for the male gaze when it comes to you know modern European art. I mean, you know, if the male gaze is about um, the, the the power dynamic that's sort of embedded in in the act of looking, um, and it's the sort of sexualized looking where the um, the woman is is the is a, the object. She is sort of presented as as kind of mindless. Um, as if she's unaware um, that she's being painted. So there's this kind of voyeuristic element. Um, there's the sort of the fleshed cheeks, but I like studying it because it, it's fascinating to me. Um, and I want to understand the context that it's coming out of. And of course- Wouldn't, wouldn't Baltus have been a better example? Mm. I you know, Bill, I was thinking the exact same thing in the mm -hmm. sense that, in the sense that Renoir is such a, because as Martha says, he's such a kind of typical example. He's, he's, he, his work looks like so much other sort of art historical work, not in factor or even in composition, but just in terms of his own position and relation mm -hmm. to his model and everything like that. Whereas Baltus is so much weirder <laughs> because so, of the- so wait a second. So wait a second. You're saying these are gradations of, of, a pornographic gaze because and, and that brings me oh, yeah. let me ask you this right because you're then acquitting because this whole history of art is full of the female nude right yeah therefore it is. <laughs> yes it, i mean the the history of art is full of the female nude it's full of sexist artists because we live in patriarchy right like i mean we you know that that's that's going to be a given and you know it's full of racist artists because we live in you know racist patriarchy and you know th those those things are all givens i mean if people are finding renoir pornographic i would say that they have a really tame idea of what pornography <laughs> is right <laughs> I agree with you. I think it's pretty pornographic. That doesn't mean that it's not also. Well, I, I, what's so interesting is that around the time that the Me Too movement sort of gained uh, momentum and around the time that Harvey Weinstein was being brought to, to task about his own crimes, um, which were genuine crimes, uh, a group of um, museum members at the Met um, started a petition to around the Baltus painting that the Metropolitan Museum in New York had. And people freaked out and there was a big article in the New York Times about Me Too culture and is it going to mean that we take all the art off the walls and what kind of litmus test and everything like that. And so I went to look and, you know, museum directors were I mean, it's a fantastic article if anyone wants to search it because museum directors were seriously losing their heads over the idea that you would do anything in relation to this Baltus. And they literally only asked that an, a line be added again to the wall label saying to contemporary viewers, this painting may strike you as disturbing because of this sexual content. That's it. That's that's what they were asking for. And people lost their minds. And so for me, it's like, well, if museum directors and curators aren't gonna, you know, do their job by helping us contextualize what we're looking at, then they shouldn't get to play with their toys anymore. So if you can't well, deal with a Baltus responsibly, then yeah, don't put it up on the wall. If yeah, you want Aruna, to Aruna, did you think that was work? enough? Was that enough to put that tag for you as a woman and a, a, to, a to scholar? Me, I'm a I'm a historian. If uh, I'm I'm trained as an art historian, if I was going to decide that people weren't worth studying or looking at based on their racism or or misogyny or whatever, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would not have anything to study. I, I, but, <laughs> I mean, and you know, Martha says the same thing about, right, co museum collections. Yeah. I would not have anything to study, but I will say now that I'm an art critic and not an art historian, I make choices about who I pay attention to and who I don't. 
Mm -hmm. I feel no need to review the whatever the artistic equivalent of Woody Allen is, right? <laughs> I have no, I feel no need to review that. It doesn't matter if their art is good or bad or indifferent. It, I have a choice of looking in a different direction. Because we have gone over, I want to thank everybody here because this will be our uh, program. This has been such a lively and vibrant conversation, but I know we have people in our live audience now waiting to uh, ask us questions. So thank you all for being here and we'll close off this portion of the show. At this time, we'll conclude part one of our panel discussion when great artists behave badly. Please be sure to join us next time for part two. And thank you for joining us today for the civil discourse.